Well, here we are. I am there in front of my computer. I've just been woken up by Mel way over there in Europe. Uh, and he is excited. We're going to be doing a whole new chapter looking, well, not really new in that it's not new for Mel. This is one of the terrific things I love about these guys. They are just, they're, they're these sleuths on the ground who have their, their chisel and their hammer and they're and they're just chiseling away at history and they're looking at all these rocks and they're looking at all these inscriptions and they're looking at all these buildings and they're looking at all the coins and they're looking at all the the, the enormous amount of, of history that's been uncovered. The more they scratch, the more they find. And the more they find, the more we shine. The more we shine, the more they whine. Oh, how sublime. As we keep on saying, whenever you unpack and look at history and just dig into the ground and start pulling up all these artifacts, you're going to start sort of following a story. And the story is leading all the time. It's leading in the same direction. Have you noticed? We've been talking about the 7th century. We're looking at the 7th century. Uh, we've been looking at Mecca more recently. Well, we're now moving into the problem of what we're, what Mel calls the North-South Divide. The North-South Divide, uh, that there was material that in the North, and when we're talking about the North, we're talking about Syria and Iraq and Jordan, that area, that then later on was then moved down to what is today Mecca and Medina. So you might want to even say that we begin with the North and we head down South. Have you heard us say this before? Well, <coughs> Mel's come up with some, actually some new evidence to support that. Some evidence, some of the evidence he's going to show you comes as far away as China. This is what's exciting because he's not looking at the traditions and just following that narrative. That's the narrative that you all have been taught. That's the narrative that I have been taught. That's the narrative that everybody has been taught. That's the only one we've been permitted to be taught because it's the only one that's been out there for 1300 years. Maybe I could even say 1200 years, but let's just go and say 1300 years for now. You notice not 1400 years. And it's because of the fact that we're looking at history, getting back to the seventh century, that Mel and his crew, and that includes Murad and uh, includes also Bala and also includes Joe and now uh, Odom and others. So this is the Sneakers Corner group. Remember that name, Sneakers Corner, because in years to come, that is the name that everybody is going to have on their lips, Sneakers Corner, and you have that bright green, iridescent green, uh, the, I guess is uh, the, the uh, emblem of Sneakers Corner uh, that has really been at the forefront. All I'm doing is giving them a platform to speak. And I'm going to do what you are going to be doing. In fact, I'm going to be and take on your position today. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sit back. I've got my pen and I've got my paper. And I'm going to just take notes. Like you, I've not heard this material at all. This is the first time I've come across it. Uh, Mel is smiling broadly because he says, you're going to love some of the things I'm going to throw at you today. I said, okay, I've got my pen and paper. And I'm going to sit and listen to Mel. As you're going to listen to Mel, it'll be the first time I've heard it, as it'll be the first time you've heard it. And then I'm going to try to come to conclusions as best I can at the end. Because I'm, uh, I'm sitting there licking my lips. Wetting my whistle. Why? Because this is, it's this kind of exercise. It's this kind of exercise that, that wakes me up in the morning. Mel had just got done saying that he's, he's probably more excited at, during this period of his life than any other. This has been the most enjoyable period of his life. Not because of COVID, not because of the pandemic, not because of the elections here in the United States. That's probably what most people will remember this year by. He's been so excited because of all these discoveries. And the fact that these discoveries are leading along the same trail. They're not taking us in all kinds of inconclusive or contradictory positions. They're actually whoop, zipping us back to the seventh center and we're seeing a trail that is easy to follow because these trails are being corroborated by, and they're being paved, you might say, by rock inscriptions and they're being paved by coins and they're being paved by artifacts that he keeps coming across with, especially quotations that have put together and are putting together slowly but surely an image a you might say an, an, an entire guideline of what exactly did happen in the seventh century in that seventh century all boy all the arrows are pointing north all the arrows are pointing on. So we're going to be doing two episodes. One episode looking at the north-south divide. We'll call it that. And I'll bring Mel on board. Mel, are you there? I am, TJ. It's great to be back. And I am very excited and very happy to share what I've uh, got for you today. 
Um, some of the material is old material that you've seen before, but I'm bringing it together in a different way and adding new material. And some of the things that weren't clear, um, say a few months ago, have become much clearer now. And so we're getting closer from, um, to a higher resolution picture. Um, one of the yes, things I've asked to him start... to get a new camera uh, as well, folks. <laughs> For those of you who have been complaining, he will invest in a good little old Logitech Brio. Boy, I should get, I should get some type of... Uh, rec remuneration from Logitech for saying that on camera, but he is going to get a better camera. So we, at least we can see him uh, in clear contrast. And also probably it'd be nice if you got a better background behind you. These look, try to look smart with some books. I always yeah, do the smell because I always <laughs> go back and grab the books that I'm, that I'm using. People yeah. now know whenever a book is this way, that means I'm using it. Whenever it's this way, I have yet to touch it or I, it's not part of what we're heading to right now. And if you notice, that's getting larger and larger. Look at the ones up there. <laughs> these are just getting taller and taller because so many more known books that I'm using for all these arguments. But that's, that's, that's in some ways, is, is, is not to be a, it's not a surprise, is it, Mel? No, absolutely not. Um, so I was going to start, Jay, with... Um, some artifacts. Um, you know, um, we're going to be talking about the fact that Islam started way up north. And a challenge I'm going to pose to our Muslim viewers is, can you produce just one artifact from early in the 7th century that might confirm the, the southern narrative, the, the standard Islamic narrative? And I'm going to show you some examples that I have here with so me. Just what we're saying here, what you're saying is the Southern narrative is a later narrative. The Northern narrative is a earlier. So we're going from early to late, so North yeah. to South. And you're saying, yeah. show me, since you're talking about the South, you Muslims have always been talking about the South. South would be also the idea of the later traditions. Show me any artifact. And this is the argument from silence that we've always been hammered with. I got this when I did my first debate in 1995. Dr. John Badawi, he, he could only, his only response is, it is all cited. There's nothing there that you can show to prove it. And now you're saying, no, well, hold on a minute. We are going to go back and we're going to show that there are things. The argument of Sidon actually we flipped on its head. Now the Muslims who are from the South and who are from much later, they've got to now show us artifacts. So go ahead. Let's open the artifacts yeah. and see what you're talking about. Okay, so um, last year I was in the Ukraine, and if someone were to ask me, um, how do I know that there were uh, Nazis in the Ukraine during World War II? Well, one of the, the, the examples of that would be the artifacts that they left behind. So while I was there, I picked up um, a passport of a Luftwaffe pilot, which you can have a look at there. Now, it, it doesn't mean that I'm agreeing with the, the, the Nazis or anything like that. It was just an example of historical artifact which I found interesting I thought I'll never have another opportunity maybe to get hold of this um, so that's like from the 1940s and it's dated and it has uh, like a metal stamp and so on and there's lots of evidence on it that would suggest that it's an authentic passport now obviously when you buy things on the street you don't know if you're buying the real thing but looking at it very clearly um, it definitely looks like it's authentic and, and that's the sort of evidence that you look for when you're trying to make a historical case, because it's, it's, as I say, it's rock solid sort of evidence. Now, um, about, I think about 10 years ago, I had a friend of a friend who um, was a rich um, Jewish millionaire um, and he was big into archeology span and he was the guy that really got me interested in history for the first time. So he gave me this out of his collection. And now I don't know, Jay, if you know what this is by any chance. I, I'm what looking it at it. It looks like it's a little lamp, isn't it? It's one of these little Jewish that's, lamps that they had in the first yeah. century. Yeah, that's the very thing. Um, so the oil would go in here and it'll wick out that end. And actually, the, it came with a letter of provenance, which said that it, it was dug in Jerusalem and it's believed to be dated from the first century. Oh, it so is from this, the first century. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so um, this could have been used at the time of Jesus, for all we know, which is an amazing... Um, 2,000 year old you're holding in your hands. 2,000 year old and, and I really should have that in a safe somewhere um, but, but I believe there are hundreds of these that have been dug up. Um, now I don't know for certain that this was 2,000 years old um, because it could be again it, it could be a for, forgery for all I know um, but that's the, that's the, at least a starting point. Um, archaeologists can examine this and they can date it and so on and they can tell usually they can tell if it's real or if it's not you know. So that's the sort of thing that we look for as solid evidence um, 
for historical claims. So my challenge, and I'm actually going to make an offer here. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I will offer 100 euros if a Muslim can produce one single um, artifact from Mecca that's independently verified from the time of Muhammad. Okay. <laughs> so to, okay. You have. Okay. So you really. You I mean, have that's a, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm so confident. I'm so confident that there is none, and there is no museum of artifacts, and I, and it has to be independently verified. Uh, we got hair from um, from uh, Muhammad or his fingernails. That's not any evidence, um, but something that's verifiable. Um, and you have till the end of January. Well, how are you going to do this? I, I'm just so you don't, just so you can cover your tracks. Because if you go, if you yep. go to the Topkapi there in uh, Istanbul, they have a hairs from the beard of Muhammad. They have a footprint that's in a stone of his footprint. It looks huge uh, of Muhammad. <laughs> they have the staff of Moses. The staff of Moses. I kid you not. And they also have the hand of. John the Baptist encased in, in uh, gold and metal. And you can see the bone. Uh, they have a hole in it where you can see the bone of his hand in there. Yeah. I, I had to laugh when I saw that. Can you imagine that they purport that this is the museum in th the Topkapa Museum there in Istanbul and here a reputable museum suggesting that that's the staff of Moses. So how are you going to prove or disprove that these people, I mean, you're going to have loads of people say, hey, well, I've got the hair of Moses, of, of, <laughs> of Muhammad. I mean, look at all these letters of Muhammad that they've been coming, the Ashtanami letter yeah. and all these, these other fraudulent claims. Are you going to be able to, yeah. are you going to be able to hold your side of the bargain on this one? Well, it will have to be independently verified. So it'll have to be um, a non, from a non-Muslim uh, scientist or archaeologist. Okay, um, we've got to be able to be able, it, be, it must be debunkable. Uh, yeah. And that's what we do. We do an awful lot of... Something, of that's, that's, something that has a date on it would be good. Um, but like anything that is, um, you know, just a, a Muslim claim only that um, independent scientists um, haven't backed up is, is not... <laughs> It's not good you're enough. And it would be, I would, I would never do and, and this because you're going to get thousands of claims now. <laughs> and there's, 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 um, it's the first one in. So if, uh, if I do pay out, that's it. You, you've won your case. It's not going to be. I'm going to be paying out for every case just to make the, um, the case clear. Um, so you know there may be a bit of discussion from um, between people to see um, whether we agree that it is good evidence or not. But um, it, it'll have to convince. Um, most non-Muslims really for it to be good evidence. Um, if it is just a superstitious- Well, it's, first of all, it's gonna to have to convince blame. you and me. To We're gonna, it's gonna to have to pass our acid test. And aren't we yeah. doing that? We've been called the myth makers by quite a number of people. We're not myth makers, we're myth breakers, we're myth busters. And one of the reasons we can bust and break uh, is because we are actually going back and looking and, li and asking these artifacts, these letters, these suppositions. I'm, I'm going through a whole series right now looking at all the claims for Mecca and I'm debunking every one of them. But I, the great thing about that, and this is what's fun, it's, it's like sleuth slaying, saying we're, we're like sleuths. We're going through and we're looking forensically and we're asking what is it that's on the ground? What is it that's back there? What do we know about? And we're looking at maps and we're looking at timelines and we're also looking at the artifacts in situ and seeing if these cannot, if these did come from there, what is the provenance that actually supports that? So you're saying they have to prove it and they have to prove it so that we're convinced that those yeah. are artifacts from that and time I, period. And in the, the same and token, we're doing the same thing with all these stories about yeah. Muhammad or these stories about how Islam began. We're demanding the same thing. Yeah. And when you say, you know, when you talk about provenance, it's usually an official way of recording that. When was it dug up? Where? By whom? And so on. There has to be a line of evidence, not just, oh, here's, here's something I've just thrown together last week. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So See you're going to be going into this north side. Let's go ahead and get into that. I'm kind of licking my lips here waiting for this because I love this okay. kind of material. It's, uh, it is the best thing on a Saturday morning to be listening to is hearing Mel come up with just not just his theories. Uh, he's going to be coming up with his material to then support what he claims. And we assume that those of you who are listening, like myself, this will be the first time for me, it'll be the first time for you, do take notes, uh, do comment, get into the comment section at the bottom, and talk about these characters, and talk about Superman. And this is, you're coming up with Superman? Is that what you're going to start with? And yes. This is the kryptonite. Okay, I'll let you get yes. into it. I'm going to shut up so you can go ahead and start with it. Go for it. God bless you. Let's see what you have to show us. Well, Luke's, uh, uh, what's his name? Luke's Lecter. Um, 
you can see he has loads of books in the background. I suppose that would be probably closer to the truth of it. But um, Muhammad is, is essentially like an Uber mensch. He's a, a Superman for uh, Muslims. So I thought it's a suitable um, analogy to use. Um, and so what I'm going to suggest really over these two parts is history is Islam's kryptonite. And at the same time, I would say that no one should be afraid of the truth. No one should be afraid of the seventh century. Um, what have Muslims got to be afraid of? So before we get into the, the meat and bones of this, um, I just want to acknowledge the work of a number of people. Murad, who has explained to me the significance of the Tayyayi and who first proposed his own version of the Iraqi thesis over a year ago. Joe and Odin, who have each come up with an alternative explanation of how the Quran came about via preachers. An idea that recalled a discarded and forgotten idea I had in early 2018 of monks addressed as Rabbani in the Quran and the clear impression of dialogue between people. This amazed me. Someone um, a few weeks ago said, Mel, are you aware that you mentioned about this back in 2018? And I had completely forgotten this, an old video I had made. And I think I had um, made the video just um, days after going through the Quran. Um, I don't know if it was the first or second time. And so I wrote down my impressions, made a little video of it, forgot all about it, and then went off um, searching things and, and completely forgotten this idea. So Joan Oden basically has a similar idea. Um, I, and I was amazed actually that I had it there and I dropped it and moved on to other ideas. But anyway. Professor Peter von Sivers regarding the centrality of the Gasnids and the Lachmids, and, and I had a, an interesting email exchange with him, and uh, he was a, a very important sort of person along the road, and also books by Robert Hoyland and Robert Spencer, who have been invaluable, really, in terms of clarifying a lot of these ideas. So Just explain we have Robert it. Hoyland and um, Robert yeah. Spencer, well, the two Roberts. Why We have two Roberts in that, who have written books, and we have two Dan's. Who have also done other minutes. We were a lot of the, the same names. So, who is Robert Hoyland and who is Robert Spencer? Robert Hoyland um, is, I suppose you could call him an, an Orientalist. He speaks um, many languages. Um, 18 languages. Is it 18? Well, when when um, I say speaks, they don't, they, you don't speak these languages because these are, languages are no longer spoken. Understand they, he reads and writes two lang yeah. uh, 18 languages. Yep. Um, so the two key books in particular from Robert Hoyland that have been very important for me is In God's Path, where he explains the origins of Islam, um, looking at the historical background. And the other one was Islam as Others Saw It, which contains multiple sources. And I've been working my way slowly through that. Um, here's the, here's um, Islam as Others Saw It. I got it right here. Uh, and I don't have the cover on it, but you can see it is a tome. It is very big. You can get this on PDF, by the way. If people want to get it, just go ahead and, and put it, Google it online and you'll see it. It's up there. But it is a treasure trove, as Mel is saying. In fact, a lot yeah. of the stuff, might, you are putting the page numbers as we go through so that people can go right to those page numbers to make sure that you are saying what Roy Hoyling was saying. I, I did know Robert Hoyling. I, I've been in his office. I've met him uh, when I was in London doing my doctoral, when I started my doctoral thesis um i would actually i bo visited both him and dr patricia corona and he was at oxford university at that time and he's very laid back he's one of these kind of characters when you live when you when you meet him he's not a he's not what you would think uh, as a uh, as an academic and the same token robert spencer the one who has who wrote this book and this is the book that uh that he has been uh that obviously that uh, has been so pivotal since 2012 he has taken a lot of things that Hoyland has said and, and others, Volker Pop and, and uh, uh, many of the great scholars that have been looking at the introduction or the emergence of Islam and put it into this book form called Did Muhammad Exist, which is provocative when it came out in 2012. Since that time, he has come to know myself and Mel, uh, and he has been looking at our videos. And I had him on this channel back in July of this year. And because of all this new material that you guys are digging up, uh, you and Sneakers Corner are digging up, he has now been, his publishers have asked him to rewrite this book. He has just finished rewriting this book. And it's getting coming out in 2021. We have to wait for it. It's about 25% larger than what is here. 
much more material than than what he had here and he's at introducing an awful lot of what we are talking about so you're going to get it in print people are saying when are you going to write this up jay when are you going to write it up i let robert spencer do the writing he is the much better writer than i am and he understands it the difficulty is this mel the difficulty is this he sent me the the uh, the the uh, the uh, parchment of it you know the pre-publication copy yeah. I sent it by email for me to look it over he just wanted me to give a peruse over and then I've just written a, a a forward for it for the new one coming out and he said tell me what you think and I looked at it and I said Robert you're already out of date this is the difficulty as <laughs> soon as you write it down even this video as soon as we upload it up on the internet it's already out of date in, yeah. it, it's a good problem. I'm not worried about that, but it is a little frustrating because you know that you're going to be coming up with some other material that's that's going to not just controvert it, but even add to it. So in, say, in knowing that, and, and this is why it's important that we put the date. We are the Saturday before Christmas when we're putting this together. So uh, what is today? What date are we talking about? We're talking about the 19th of December. What we're saying here on the 19th of December, Mel, would you not, could you not probably hand over heart, you probably would say that in another week or two weeks or even a month or maybe two months, you'll be have some new material that's going to add to it. So don't Absolutely. hold us and say you're lying when we say something in another two months that may even contradict what we're saying today. That's one of the difficulties when you're virginal and you're the first in this area and you're the first that's coming up with it. I don't see, I've seen video after video where Muslims are saying, you said this. There's a big one that's going all over the internet right now about what I said 20 years ago about Zakir Naik being one of the most dangerous men uh, against Christianity. I said that in the last century when he was dangerous, but he's not dangerous today. The guy has gone flat on his face and he's having to hide out in Malaysia. He can't even go home. So he's nothing of the, he's nothing of, uh, of the stature that he was back in the last century. And so be careful. I, we will always date what we're saying because we may have to, and by, de by definition, the kind of work we're doing. Since you're digging away and you're scratching and, and pulling things out of the ground, you're going to have to go with what you find. You're going to have to go with the evidence in your hand. And as you're saying here, this north-south divide that we're going to talk about in this segment may have to change. We might have to change it and add to it or be uh, uh, tweak it along the, uh, on the borders to make sure that we're saying the right thing at the time that we have the evidence in that. Yeah. I, th I definitely think Robert will be doing a third edition of his book in a couple of years. And a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth. And, and I said, listen, this is, you, whether you like it or not, Robert, you're going to be our spokesman. You're going to be our, our pundit. You're going to be our writer. And he just loved that. He says, listen, I just love what you guys are doing. I just sit back and I just benefit. Uh, in, in the same way that I benefit, Mel, because you come and use my platform to, be, to get it out to the whole world. But then we use Robert Spencer to write it down in a book form so people can read it and have it in their library so they can sit it up on their shelves and hopefully their books are going your book his book is going this way so i keep his book this way because i'm always referring to it going back to it along with hoyland's anyway that's that more good. that's enough said i think i think people get to understand we just need to put those caveats in there so people don't hammer us later on saying that we're not lying or contradicting ourselves yeah jay this fits completely in with what you've just said um my current view as of december 2020 is the following four points muhammad's biography is a composite fiction based on a real historical protagonist whose story is very different numerous later figures and biblical typographies from that of jesus and moses number two this chief political protagonist on whom muhammad is based had nothing to do with the formation of the quran the Quran, which is a misnomer, was largely the correspondence of preachers in a Judeo-Christian sect, and the tafsirs in the Quran have misinterpreted the meaning of the Quran. And these are big statements I'm making. Number three, the beginnings of Islam occurred in the north, mostly in Iraq, Syria, and the Jordan area. And lastly, early sources are not only able to confront that this standard Islamic narrative is wrong, but they can identify the evolution from the old, mostly historical narrative to the new, mostly fictional narrative. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Wow. So, so those are, those are big. I mean, what you're saying there is very big because you're actually going into these. And if people could just remember these four points that they, the whole, the idea of Muhammad's biography is a composite that this, a uh, seventh century Muhammad was nothing to do, has nothing to do with the ninth century Muhammad. Maybe that's the best way to put it. The seventh century Muhammad is nothing yeah. like the ninth century Muhammad. And that yeah. the beginning of Islam occurred in the north, that we're going from north to south, and we're also going uh, from 
Ilya ibn Kabisa to the Muhammad that we find in the ninth century. And then the last one is that these early sources that you're coming across, all this material that you guys at Seekers Forum are coming across, it not only confronts that standard narrative, but also helps us along the building blocks, gives a building block to how we came to those. So, you're, it, and I think this, is, this has been a question that many of the viewers keep coming up with. Help us to put this all together because we're getting we're getting confused. Are you saying it's Petra? Are you saying it's Iraq? Are you saying it's southern Turkey? All these different things, these different places on the map. Are you saying it's the sixth century, seventh century that things start to change in the eighth century? What are you saying? Because we're, we're we're throwing so much new material at them. What you're going to be doing, and I think this is one of the nice things about this particular segment. You're going to show that this did not happen immediately. It happened and evolved slowly. But as you watch and look the trajectory, you will see these early sources take you on the trajectory. We can now are starting to put it together. And it is flowing. And it does not confront each other. It does not contradict each other. It complements the, yeah. the, almost all the material that you've been coming across. I think the, the hardest thing maybe for some people to accept is the idea that Muhammad had nothing to do with the formation of the Quran. And I think that's the biggest one. Because once you well, make that's a that pretty just... big one for a good reason. You just yeah. shut down everything that Islam is dependent on, the book of the man. I mean, you can yeah. see why they're gonna they're gonna be they're, they're gonna be an awful lot of people that are angry with you what you're doing here. Because you're not only just taking on the uh, the, the man itself, you're not just taking also the whole emergence of this large quickly growing second largest religion on earth you're also confronting that which this man was supposedly sent to earth to do and that is to receive this revelation you're hitting both the book and the man simultaneously yeah these are two parallel parallel um things that are happening in the seventh century and people have um assumed that both of these are connected but what i'm suggesting that the evidence suggests that these there's a political uh genesis and there's a religious genesis and these are not connected they can connected in the time of Abdul al-Malik, but before that, these were distinct um, movements. Um, and by thinking that they're one and the same movement, it, it um, leads to lots of confusion. Um, but once you uh, decouple that, it's much easier to see what's really going on. So there we have it on that. So in this first half then, the first part, part one, um, I'm going to be arguing that the standard narrative is wrong in part two. Um, who was the main protagonist for the political genesis of the of the revolution that later became known as Islam? So part one, the standard Islamic narrative is wrong. I'm going to suggest there were at least two standard Islamic narratives. The northern narrative, most of which has been expunged from the records, and the southern narrative. The standard Islamic narrative that we have today is essentially the southern narrative. Now, a quote from Thomas the Presbyter. You've seen this, I'm sure, many times. Mm -hmm. There was a battle between the Romans and the Tayyaye of Muhammad in Palestine, 12 miles east of Gaza. You will hear almost nothing about the Tayyaye in the standard Islamic narrative. Why? That should concern us. Why have the Tayyaye been painted out of the picture? Why have they been airbrushed out? There's obviously- well, that's interesting. So they've been expunged, you think, intentionally, and that you're yeah. gonna that's I assume you're gonna say that. If you and yeah. isn't this symptomatic of what you do as if you're a new ruler, if you're a new emperor, if you are new coming into a new empire, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to eradicate your predecessors. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's going to, I'm going to show you why it, it was um, why they were got rid of the essentially as a, an identifier, it became redundant as an identifier, and this is largely to do with the splits and infighting that went on in the Tayyaye, as, as we'll see later. And that's why the tribal name got changed, and then a subgroup within the Tayyaye was emphasized. But I suppose to start with, who were they? Who are the Tayyaye? So this is very key to understanding what happened. But first of all, um, the Tayyaye are referred to as the Tay. They're also known as Tayyi. It is a large and ancient Arab tribe, and the patronymic of Tay is Al Tayyi, if I pronounced it correctly. When did the Tayyaye move north? So, in the second century CE, the Tayyaye migrated from Yemen to the northern Arabian mountain ranges of Jab Jabal Shamar, which was formerly called Jabal Tay. As you can see where it is, and, and notice where it's located. 
which is south of Petra. And uh, it's, this, is, this is going to be key because, um, as we'll see in a moment, they'll move further north from there again and spread out just interject into real that quickly. whole region. Is this Edom? Um, so, yeah, um, no, Edom is further north than this. So you're talking a few hundred miles uh, further north. Um, so if you, if you take, say, the letter M there of Shamar, it's above, above that again. So, uh, okay. so it's, these it's people tell... originally came from Yemen, way down in the south, what is today Yemen, uh, what used to be the Hadramat back then. I have yeah. to keep on saying that so you don't get ha hammered by people that say you don't know what you're talking about. Yemen is the modern day reference for what used to be the Hadramat, that southern area. And they were, they, in the, so you're talking about second century, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about a good 600 years before Islam came into being, or as we yeah. know it today. So this is yeah. long, long in the past. Yeah. So like their connection with Yemen has pretty much gone at this stage by the time of the second century. And it would, they would have a vague memory of their connections with Yemen. Maybe they've, they, they maintain some, uh, some form of uh, trading connection, maybe perhaps, but beyond that, they, they're now identifying themselves as a Northern tribe from the second century onwards. What would Shama be today? Uh, oh. Is that uh, Jordan? I suppose Petra. It, it, it would be Jordan and um, Northern Arabia, Northern Saudi Arabia. As far. Uh, I'd have to check it against um, a map just to see where the, the borders end and so on. But well, this would be Nabatea then. Jordan. Nabat these would be Nabataeans. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, it definitely would be within the Nabataean uh, region. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the late century, uh, 6th century, the Fasad War split the Tayyaye, with members of its Jadila branch converting to Christianity and migrating to Syria, where they became allied with the Ghassanids, and the Goat branch remaining in Jabal Tay. The Tayyaye also became well established in the Lakhmid region too. So where you see the Ghassanid kingdom there on the left hand side, that would be equivalent to Syria more or less. And the Lakhmid area to the east would be more or less equivalent to Iraq. Okay. Now, obviously the frontiers change over time, but as a rough approximate, that would be, be fair enough. The Ghassanid Kingdom obviously covered uh, the Jordan area in modern day um, Middle East. Okay. So essentially what you have there is you have the Taiyai that are spreading north and then um, having an influence in those areas. Now, the Taiyai identifier became a less useful marker of identity over time as splits increased, as, as we'll see. The Taiyai were split during the first fitna with those based in Arabia and Iraq supporting Ali as caliph and those in Syria supporting Muawaya. Nonetheless, a branch of the Tay under Kataba ibn Shabib were among the leaders of the Bastard Revolution, which toppled the Umayyads in the middle of the 8th century. The Tay fared well under the Abbasids producing military officials. So as you can see, they may have split, but they continue to have an influence. So we're talking about now, we're talking about 660, because that's when Mu'awiyah comes to power. Yeah. So 650, 660s. Yeah. Okay. Now, what's interesting, okay, we can see where they're dominating. The, mm -hmm. the, the Taye dominated the Lakhmid region so much that the area of Mesopotamia became known as Tashkistan in the 7th century. Isn't that interesting that they were so dominant that the name of the area got changed to Tashkistan, which is, means land of the Tay. Oh, okay. This yeah. is not the same as Tajikistan that we use today. No, there, there, there's a, a linguistic connection, uh, which I'll actually touch on later in the PowerPoint. Um, but just to give you a rough idea of their sphere of influence in the 7th century, you can see um, it's quite extensive. So into um, what we would call today Iraq, northern and southern Iraq towards the east, um, and in the west in, in the region what we would call today Syria and the Jordan. So it's, it's quite an extensive um, sphere of influence. Now, in terms of the overall population of these areas, these were um, a subgroup, but a very influential and powerful group within the, within the overall population. Okay. Now, what's interesting is the central 
Hijaz was outside the Taye sphere of influence, i.e. where the standard Islamic narrative says Muhammad began Islam. So do you see the disconnect between Muhammad and the Taye if you hold to the standard Islamic narrative? So we're kind of see how in the historical sources we're seeing a link between the Taye and Muhammad, and yet in the standard Islamic narrative, there's an obvious disconnect there. It's a hole in the narrative to use um, a very famous person's <laughs> words. Becoming less so as the days go on. <laughs> yeah. Early sources indicate uh, the standard Islamic narrative doesn't square up with what actually happened. So the Northern uh, narrative... Is there, is there, are you, imp imp are you <laughs> implicitly implying that the standard Islamic narrative is a sin? I think I love the word you're using to incorporate <laughs> that. Your anachronisms <laughs> are bursting with information. <laughs> I, I'm sure that's not lost on the audience. I couldn't resist that one. I was too. You're waiting for uh, someone to jump in to say that too, weren't you? <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a bit of a joker, right? The northern narrative. Uh, this is the earliest narrative. Uh, traces of this earlier nar narrative survived long after the newer narrative took over. So this is going to be key. Okay. So let's build up this narrative then. So. These early sources give an indication of the information that was available at that time and would have been part of the overall narrative and the overall sort of knowledge that people had at that time. So Thomas the Presbyter, um, you have the dates there. Um, it's dated to 634. Um, there was a battle between the Romans and the Tayyayi of Muhammad in Palestine, 12 miles east of Gaza. Now, the reason for the early dating of this 640 CE is, is because of the precision of the dating there. It's clearly very close to the time. And we see that the Taye is connected with Muhammad. Now, note the group he's associated with, the location of the event, which is, as you can see, east of Gaza, and to a lesser degree, the source of the information, Mesopotamia, because that's where it was written, are all <coughs> indicators that it's up in the north. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Note also the name or title given, Muhammad, is spelt with a T, which indicates it is a Pahlavi word, which is the language of Sasanian Persia. So we're getting a hint really here that there's a Persian link, there's a Persian connection, and everything about this suggests that Muhammad is linked to the north, even though this is a very short source. So there's a lot in this, and, and it's easy over, to overlook so much of the significance of this. Now, just so people are understanding, when you're saying Romans, you're meaning, you're meaning Byzantine. The Byzantine, yeah. yeah. Um, they would have been still called the Romans into that era. In fact, if we were to use Byzantines, that they, they would know what we're talking about. Um, the Byzantines are what we call them now, but back in those days, they wouldn't have been referred to as the Byzantines. Just so people, because people will probably say, you're not saying this is all happening in Italy. No, this is happening. This is the Byzantine Empire that was headquartered up there in Constantinople. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then we also have the fragment on the Arab conquests, which is written even earlier, 636 AD. And many villages were ruined with killing by blank. We don't know what was written there. Muhammad. And a great number of people were killed and captives were taken from Galilee as far as Beth something. So again, why does it mention Muhammad in such an orderly location? And what's interesting, the later tradition scrubs this from the record. He never enters the promised land. Why remove this? Isn't that interesting that they have got rid of this? And in this standard Islamic narrative, he, a bit like um, uh, Moses, um, he sees the promised land, but never enter, enters it. And Joshua takes over. So that's oh, interesting. Just... That... Okay, so this is 636, another reference. Where is this fragment that you're talking about? This uh, fragment um, right there. This um, was written in the front of a gospel. Um, um, I believe it was a Syrian uh, gospel. And uh, it's, it is a contemporary reference. It's believed to have been written in the same year, 636. And, and it's about... exactly is this Muhammad? This is the Ilyas Ibn Gabisa? I presume so. Um, it doesn't give us enough information, but we, we'd have to assume that this is ES. 
And uh, the can you then understand how this supports uh, what we've been saying? This has been another uh, uh, question that has come up on the writing of Sabaeus. Sabaeus refers to a Muhammad who kills an awful lot of people. Well, this would be supported by this fragment here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, um, I don't know if you, uh, if you put those two together, because now when people say, ah, there's a proof of Muhammad. No, it isn't. That what uh, Sabaeus, the, the, the Christian cleric, is talking about is this Muhammad. This is the 7th century Muhammad. This would be supported by this fragment as well, if, it's the, yeah. if the date is 636. Muslims can't get around the, the, the fact that in the Islamic standard narrative, Muhammad never goes to Syria, apart from in his childhood, which we'll grant, but we're talking about the conquest. He's meant yep. to have died before this. He's meant to be dead and buried in 632. What's he doing alive in 636, according to this source? This. And I think yeah. in the Sabaeus uh, uh, documents, he's in Jerusalem. That's, again, too far north. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're seeing a picture here that it doesn't fit with the standard narrative. Now, there's lots of contradictions and it's very hard to try and put together a consistent narrative, a consistent narrative because there's, there's contradictions. We, under, we don't understand exactly why there's contradictions. Maybe some people get it wrong, maybe they get their dates wrong and so on. But clearly, when you gather all the sources together, it's painting a different picture and it's pick, painting an orderly um, location well, it's painting Muhammad. the same picture. It's just different from the the, the, the sin that you're talking about, standard Islamic yeah. narrative. Okay. Yeah. Now, it might surprise many that an area in northern Iraq and Syria had been referred to as Arabia a long time ago. Now, this is this obviously may not be new news to most people, but for some, it might be new or news. Pliny the Elder, as far back as 79 AD, refers to Oz, uh, let me say this right, Osroin and uh, Kamajin as Arabia. So those two areas in the middle of the map there, which are way up in um, northern Syria and northern Iraq. So he referred to that as Arabia. And Plutarch calls Abgar II an Arab philarch. And Tacitus calls Abgar V a king of the Arabs. Now Abgar was ruling out of Edessa, which you can see city up there in Osroin. And this is quite strange for us because we think of Arabia nowadays as being just Saudi Arabia. But okay. the notion of what was Arabia and who were the Arabians changed over time. And this is, mm. this is something that we have to grapple with. Um, and it might be partly got to do with the fact that with the Southern narrative, our conception of where everything happened got changed. But we see here from nearly 2,000 years ago, um, references to Arabs being way up in the north. Okay, and this is what we're talking about is Syria. That uh, this is That's the area you're looking at. I mean, I, it looks like almost southern parts of Turkey. Yeah, it would be, yeah, actually. Edessa, yeah. there's Edessa, there's, uh, that's southern part of Turkey. So we are way yeah. far north. And yeah. when we say Arabia, we think of Saudi Arabia, which is, has only been around since the 1700s. So even that is something that we need to be careful uh, that we go, try to get the names that are, that, that, are uh, that were used. And also put her on a map. Thanks for putting on the map so we can see that, yeah. uh, that Arabia would include all this northern area. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, the Romans, I think in the, I think it might have been in the second century, I stand corrected, uh, would have divided up Arabia then into the three regions. Uh, the Yemen area would have been called Arabia Felix, and then the central area would have been called Arabia Deserta, which means abandoned Arabia because there was almost no one <laughs> living there. <laughs> and which is and all the, the more part of your whole thesis, isn't it? It's all yeah. abandoned. Why is it that Islamic traditions have incorporated and put enormous amount of sophisticated villages and towns and cities when there's nothing there? That's why the Romans said it. It's deserted. <laughs> yeah. And way up north, then they called it Arabia Petraea um, in connection with uh, Petra. the importance of Petra. There you um, go. So it's it's in, I yeah, love this. Absolutely. We so should get a go. map and put that up there and keep reminding people everything about the 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 later narratives uh, is when is great for the ninth century but absolutely hopeless for the seventh century. Yep. Okay, so um, the Hispanic Chronicle of seven fifty four. Um, due to its distance from events, it's 
report seems to have survived the later changes. So even though this is quite late, it seems to represent the earlier narrative, the Norden narrative, rather than the later one. And that's why I'm using this. The Saracens rebelled in 618, the seventh year of the Emperor Heraclius, and appropriated for themselves Syria, Arabia, and Mesopotamia. More through trickery than through the power of their leader, Muhammad, and they devastated the neighboring provinces, proceeding not so much by means of open attacks as by secret incursions. Thus, by means of cunning and fraud rather than power, they incited all of the frontier cities of the empire and finally rebelled openly, shaking the yoke from their necks. Notice that Syria, Arabia and Mesopotamia are Tayaye areas. This confirms again the link between Muhammad and the Tayaye. So this source is fantastic. It really tells us where it all began. It happened in Syria, Arabia, as in Northern Arabia, and Mesopotamia. That's where it started. It didn't start the way the standard Islamic narrative says it started, way down south in the Hejaz. Now, um, another source, and you mentioned Sabios, a fantastic source. Here he says the following. So they, that is the Jews, expelled from Edessa, departed, taking the road through the desert to Tashkestan, Arabia. Do you remember that, Tashkestan? Tashkestan, to, right. to the sons of Ishmael. The Jews called the Arabs to their aid and familiarized them with the relationship they had through the books of the Old Testament. In that period, a certain one of them, a man of the sons of Ishmael named Mahmed, became prominent. Mahmed taught them to recognize the God of Abraham. He ordered them all to assemble together and to unite in faith. Now it's interesting, where did you meet, or where did these Jews meet Muhammad? Was it down in the Hejaz? No. Or was no. it in Iraq? There you go, Tajikistan, which would be Iraq. You're right. Yep. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it just follows and, the same pattern. And and also the thing is, uh, this this person who's referred to as Muhammad, how could he order them all to assemble together? Who has the power to order people around and, and get them to assemble together? Do you think a wacky preacher in the deserts would be able to do that? If yep. Maybe if they were, um, I don't know, what's his name? Um, Billy Graham, maybe? <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, we're talking about someone who is in authority, you know, and that's, we're going to see more of that in part two. But we see a clear indication that Muhammad and the Taye are linked, and the Taye are located in the north, i.e. Mesopotamia. It doesn't make clear if Muhammad was also located there, due to the way it transitions to Muhammad, but it suggests it. Okay. And here's Tajask, uh, Tashkistan in northern Mesopotamia. Um, and you can see this map um, is based um, on the period 610 to 641. Now you can see Tashkistan is located between the rivers Euphrates and the Tigris. And uh, as, this, as you can see there, it stretches from, a, say, roughly Edessa, all the way down to Tessaphon, okay? Now we will come back to the most likely candidate for who this Muhammad was in part two, um, but let's move on. This is uh, um, a source that has become very famous in recent times uh, on, on the channel, the Byzantine Arabic Chronicle of 741. This is the That's last- the Byzantia message. Arabica that we've talked about quite a bit, for those who are yeah. just wondering. Yeah. So the, this is the last vestige of the old northern narrative, it's 741. Abdul al-Malik, assuming the apex of his kingdom, ruled for 20 years. In the first year of his rule, he directed all the, the experience and virtue of the mind of his army against uh, Abdullah al-Zubair, whom his father had attacked so many times in various wars, all the way finally to Mecca, as they consider it, the home of Abraham, which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. Now, I think I'm, did I pronounce that correctly? Ur of the Chaldeans, I think I did. Yep, um, so let's have a look at, at where that is. It's up here, okay? At least um, according to my reckoning, um, in those days, as, as just to recall, um, there was no knowledge of Ur being in Southern um, Iraq. At, in those days, they would have presumed that Ur was in the same location as Edessa, but, whether we 
take Ur as Edessa, the location associated with Abraham's birth according to local folklore, or if we take Ur to mean the location in southern Iraq. Either way, Mecca would be somewhere in Syria or Iraq and not in the south. And this was um, a piece of evidence that uh, Murad pointed out to me in his early uh, version of the Iraqi thesis. So the idea that um, that Mecca existed somewhere between um, Ur and uh, Karhe. Now, the, the only problem with his thesis was that he assumed that Ur was way down in southern Iraq. And for me, the problem with it as a source was that it was a huge distance between Karhe and um, Ur way down south. But as you can see in this map, if you assume that Ur is in Edessa and Kare is, as you can see in the map, that's the same as Haran, um, then it's more precise. It's between a relatively um, short distance, and that makes more sense. Can I just jump in here? Yeah. This is the, uh, looking at that map there, and it's too bad we don't have a map of where the present day Ur is. That present day Ur, and this is where maybe uh, Muran needs to be. Needs to be uh, needs to be a little bit more careful. The present day Ur uh, in southern Iraq is was only understood was only discovered in 1853 uh, by that uh, by, by by the British archaeologist. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. And that, so therefore, it's a much it's a little over it's, it's well uh, we're we're coming up on 200 years ago, just not even 200 years ago when it was then brought down to Ur. But we're you're you're looking at the eighth century in the eighth century, 741 mid eighth century. That they hadn't yet discovered that Ur, so of course this would be the Ur, this would be where they thought Abraham came from. The, uh, in the eighth century, we've got to always do as we've said always, always, always go back to the time period that we're referring to, not what we would know today. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of things wrong in history, and so that's a good yeah. reason why we need to understand that this was considered to be the birthplace of, uh, of Abraham or where he lived, and so therefore uh, it was wrong. That is true, but we, we didn't. They didn't. They hadn't yet discovered the real Ur. And the other thing to bear in mind is what, what is meant by the Chaldeans, the Chaldees. Well, the Chaldees me, means the magicians. These are people who are um, into sort of magic and superstition and even Neoplatonism and all sorts of things. There was an academy in Athens that was closed down in the, um, the early part of the 6th century. And where did they move to? They moved to Haran, um, which is, as you say, down the road from Ur here on the map. So Odessa mm -hmm. is Ur. Um, so, again, it's confirmation of a connection between the Chaldees and this location of Edessa. Okay. 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 All right. So, obviously, the changing of the guards requires a changing of the narrative. So, as you can see here, we have the old narrative, which is the Northern Historical Story, or NHS, for... Uh, as an acronym. Uh, <laughs> I love national. that. So for those of you who don't know why he's smiling and why he's laughing, uh, the NHS is the National Health Service in Britain. And everybody swears by it for obvious reason, because it's what saves you. It's what heals you. It's the socialized medicine that has, so, has been one of the big success stories there in Britain for many, many years. So he's putting the NHS, Northern Historical Story, uh, uh, versus the Southern Islamic narrative, which is sin. Sin is the opposite of the NHS. <laughs> so you're doing tongue in cheek uh, that the Northern story, Northern historical uh, story is the true story. And sin, as we know, is the false story in the South. <laughs> as you can see from the diagram, the, the, old, the old narrative and the new narrative overlap each other. So in the 680s, I believe, was when the, the new Southern narrative began to take shape. And then it became more definitive around the 750s when the Abbasids took over. And then from then onwards, the Southern narrative um, took over completely. And the old narrative was forgotten, with the exception maybe in local areas where it probably retained some memory, maybe for decades, possibly even for centuries. But essentially, in terms of the empire, it was all about the Southern narrative from that point onwards. Now, some sources suggest the beginnings of the Southern narrative. So let's take John Bar Pinkaye, 687, a sanctuary in the south. One of the Arabs by name Zubair made his voice heard from a distance. He made it known about himself that he had come out of zeal for the house of God, and he was full of threats against the Westerners, claiming that they were transgressors of the law. He came to a certain locality in the south, 
where their sanctuary was and lived there. Now notice there be, we see a, a touch of the southern narrative there, but it is not clear where in the south he is referring to. Was it Petra? That would be south of the western region. Was it Mecca in the Hejaz? If it was, then his contemporary Jacob, Bishop of Edessa, 684 to 688, flat out contradicts him. So this could be the, the very beginning of this idea of things having started from the south. So Jacob, Bishop of Edessa, as we said, um, this is one we, we've referred to before. It's referring to praying to the Kaaba, but doesn't say Mecca, so bear that in mind. For it is not to the south that the Jews pray, nor either do the Magre. The Jews who live in Egypt and also the Magre there, as I saw with my own eyes and will now set out for you, pray to the east and still do, both peoples, the Jews towards Jerusalem and the Magre towards the Kaaba. And those Jews who are to the south of Jerusalem pray to the north and those in the land of Babel, in Hira and in Basra pray to the west. And also the Magre who are there pray to the west towards the Kaaba and those who are to the south of the Kaaba pray to the north towards that place. So from all this that has been said, it is clear that it is not to the south that the Jews and the Magre here in the regions of Syria pray, but towards Jerusalem or the Kaaba, the patriarchal places of their races. Now, if that didn't make any sense to you, I have a map. So what, what they're actually saying is that the people in Syria, the Jews and the Magre, they were praying south to here, but he has witnessed Jews and Magre to the west praying to the east, and those over here in Iraq praying west and so on. So he's suggesting very clearly that this is where the Kaaba was and not further south. Can I jump in there and hold that map yeah. there? We also have the archaeological work that was done by Creswell and Ferravardi in 1905, were the first to actually go to where, see where you have Najaf and Karbala, uh, to Kufa. Kufa would just be in that area, which would used to be Hira, just southwest of Babylon. And they were, I'm sorry, just southwest of Baghdad. Uh, that's where they did their digging, and they found the Wasit Mosque, and they also found the Kufa Mosque, the two two of the oldest mosques, and they dug down to the original floor plans of those mosques, and they found the Qibla walls. And these are the first two Qibla walls that were discovered by Western archaeologists, 1905. And they noticed that the Qiblas were facing directly west. When they went over to the other side, it's just off the map to Egypt, they went outside of Cairo to the old garrison town called Fustat. And there in Fustat, they dug down to the original floor plans, and they came to the Qibla wall of the original floor plans of the Fustat Mosque, and it's facing directly east. And so they noted this in 1905. That's over 100 years ago. They noticed this, that, that it looked like, and they suggested that looked like that the Qiblas were facing Jerusalem. Now, we know now today, uh, Dan Gibson has gone back there and gone both, uh, he's gone to the Wasit Mosque and he's also gone to the Kufa Mosque and he's also gone to the Fustat Mosque. And he's made it, he's shown very care carefully that both the Fustat and the Kufa Mosque are facing not Jerusalem, they're facing Petra. And the Wasit Mosque, the word itself means in between, it's facing in an in between direction that's halfway between uh, Petra and uh, and what is today Mecca. Now, for that reason, the archaeological evidence is supporting what Jacob of Edessa is saying here, almost exactly. Jacob of Edessa would not have uh, would not have had GPS to know exactly where they they were facing. He just assumed it was Jerusalem, but he was off by three to five degrees. Why? Because back then he wouldn't have anything. He wouldn't have known better. And so that's why it's fascinating today with GPS coordination. We know that actually it was they were not facing Jerusalem. They were both facing they were both facing Petra in this case. Yep. Now we move on to the Chinese sources. So Dashi, also written as that uh, in Chinese characters, was the Chinese name for the Arabs and the Muslims in Persia and Central Asia in general. The name first appears in sources of the Tang period as Du Shi or Du O Shi. Um, the word is derived from the designation of one particular Arabian tribe called Taye or Tay that was in Middle Persian transformed into Tajik or Tazi, the origin of the state Tajikistan. So this is the connection with Tajikistan. 
Another explanation of the word dashi is the Arabian word for merchant, tajir. So it's interesting, there's a connection there between um, merchant and tayaye. This will come to prominence later. Perhaps the idea that Muhammad was a tajir, palavi for a merchant, stems from him being a tajir in the sense of being of the Tay tribe, right? So when we see in the sources, sometimes Muhammad being referred to as a merchant, perhaps, and this is, this is a hunch, that maybe the word that's been used is the word which um, means that he's a member of the Tay and not necessarily a merchant. So this is perhaps the origin of this whole story of Muhammad being a merchant and, and that ties in with the, the wider Islam, Islamic narrative of Khadija and all this trading and he was an honest guy and all that. Maybe this is built on a mountain of sand and it is based on confusion about the word Tajir. So it's a, it's a possibility. Good stuff. A different story appears in the 750s after the takeover of the Abbasids. Now, this is very key because this is a smoking gun. You know, we're sometimes accused of a conspiracy theory because we're saying that there was an old narrative and a new narrative. But what if even the Chinese noticed this in the 750s? Well, this is exactly what we find. The Dashi, or the Taiyei, sent an envoy to China in 751 with a story of how they came to power. After 651, the Dash, Dashi sent envoys three more times, 701, 705, and so on. However, the Tang government noticed something peculiar, something odd, when they received envoys during the years of CJ. Uh, 756 to 758 AD. They were told a completely different story of how the Dashi were founded. This time Muhammad's name appears and the story this time is like the standard Islamic narrative we have today. The Chinese were confused so they recorded both story versions which is great that they did. Isn't that fascinating that um, at the time when the Abbasids had taken over in the 750s suddenly the Chinese noticed that the story had changed. So and that's that we're talking about 756 now. This yes. this last one when the Tang the Tang government notices something odd and that's between 756 and 758. Yep. So there's a there's there's obviously something going on there. Why have the Abbasids um, changed the story? And I, I would suggest that one of the reasons is they're not going to be bragging about the Taiyaye uh, now because they have been in a conflict you know, inside the, the, the larger tribal group of the Taiye, there's been a split. So this name no longer has major significance for them. They're going to emphasize in their new account how a subgroup um, are the, the real founders of, um, of what we call today Islam. And why would they do that? To justify the fact that they are in power. So they have changed the story um, as, as a way of holding on to power and to project their, um, their authority, their uh, right to rule. Even as far away as China, they want to emphasize this. So it's, it's fascinating. And here is the, the uh, source itself. Notice that we still see traces of the old Northern narrative, but the Quraysh and Muhammad are now central. So as I said at the beginning, Okay, this is a significant change, but we can still see a slow evolution. It will take um, a couple of um, decades later with Ibn Isaac and, and then later again with Ibn Hisham for this story to fully ferment and become a completely different story. But here we can see elements of both the old and the new narrative. So let me just get straight into that. Another saying, <laughs> another saying, is that the ruling clan of the Dashi, Taiye tribe, is called Guli or Quresh during the year of Kai Huan of the Su dynasty. There are two families within the, I'm going to use Quresh or Quresh um, just to make it clear. One family is called uh, Penny uh, Shishen, which is the Banu Hashem, and the other is Penny Mohuan or the Banu Marwan. There was a man from the 
Penny Shishen called Moki Mo. That's Muhammad, who was very brave and wise and was hailed as the king by the tribe people. The king, Moki Mo, then expanded the king's, uh, sorry, the kingdom's territory stretching across 3,000 leagues from east to west with his mighty forces. He also conquered the city of Shia which is Syria, which is called City Shan, which is Damascus. Now, before anyone says this, the Chinese are rendering these words in Chinese and they're doing their best to get the closest representation of the word according to how they are hearing it. That's, that's well, called he, transliteration, and we do that even yeah. today. Uh, if you were to go into uh, any dictionary or you go into any encyclopedia and you look up the word Muhammad, just look at that word, even in English, how would you write that in, in, in modern standard English? It could be M-O-H-E-M-M-E-D or M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D. Look at the word Quran. It's a lot in, uh, for many years, it used to be K-O-R-A-N, but now it is Q-U-R apostrophe A-N. They're completely different spellings almost look like completely different words but it's actually the same word and so this when you transliterate it you try to write it in your script as you hear it coming from the foreigner's voice and so that makes when they heard it the Chinese heard uh, the, uh, the the people coming who are coming from the Abbasids when they were meant referring to Muhammad they heard it as Mokemo so that's why it they wrote it Mokemo yeah uh, so notice that it's saying that there's a ruling clan within the Taiyei. So if you imagine the, the, the larger group is the Taiyei, and then within this large group, you have the ruling clan, which is the Koresh, which I'm going to suggest based on later evidence we'll see in a second, they are the Persian group within the Taiyei. So the, tri the Taiyei is a tribe which is transnational. It doesn't stick nicely within the borders. It's a, it's a mobile tribe that spreads across Iraq, Syria, and even into Persia. Now there's a subgroup, as I say, the, the ruling clan, which are the Quraysh, okay? And this is what we've discovered. And within that group called the Quraysh, there are two important families. There's the Banu Hashim, and there's the Banu Marwan, right? Now the Banu Hashim is connected with Muhammad, according to the, the Chinese source. And notice the other one, the Banu Marwan. Why is that significant, Jay? Well, Marwan. Because the Marwan family are the ones that come into power in 680. They were the ones that take over the, and su subvert the Sufyani family, which of which Muawiyah was a part of. And they were, in, uh, they were a subgroup that then become the dominant group within the Umayyad dynasty. So we know the dates yeah. for that. Those are well known. So it's fascinating that even they're being picked up in these Chinese sources. Yeah. So you can see here that uh, from the, the point of view of the 750s, um, the Chinese are basically saying that we are from, the, the real people that started everything are the Quraysh. It wasn't the Taiye. They're, they're basically saying, no, it's not these, these low life Arabs as they probably would have viewed them you know, the per, from the Persian point of view. No, it was the ruling clan that were key to all of this because both the Umayyads and in terms of the ruling group, the Umayyads and the, um, the Abbasids were Persian. So they were the ones that were in charge, okay? And we see that by the 750s, the Banu Marwan have been suppressed and the Banu Hashim have taken over. And they are the Abbasids, essentially. That's how I read it, at least. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting. No, this is terrific. I mean, you can understand that why they've come to these conclusions. Yeah. Now, it goes on to say that the Quraysh, with its Marwan clan and the Hashim, clan were the white coated Arabs. Now bear this in, um, in mind that uh, with the identities here, that, um, they're referred to here as Arabs, but there are other Chinese sources that will say that the ruling clan were in fact Persians. So the, if you imagine a pyramid, on the top you have the Persians and underneath you have the Arabs who are doing all the fighting for them, you know. So there's, okay. a, and there's, a, there's that going on. A person from Mulu in and in sorry in Hurasan, in Persia, called uh, um, Abu Muslim, plotted to overthrow Marwan. He announced to the people that whoever was on his side should put on black clothes. He soon collected an army of several thousand men and slew Marwan. Abu al Abbas, 
of the clan of Hashem was chosen king, and henceforth they were known as the Black Coated Arabs. And this, in the Chinese, is the explanation for, for why the Abbasids are in charge. So it's very interesting. So the Black Coated would be the Abbasids, the White Coated would be the Umayyads. Exactly. Yeah. Now, despite the Chinese sources referring to these key, key clans as white dressed Arabs, then black uh, dressed Arabs, it is clear from another Chinese source that these are more precisely to be termed Persians. This contradiction is due to centuries of border changes. These same people could be termed Talyaye, Mesopotamian, Arab, and or Persian. Border changes meant a fluid sense of identity, but I think the key thing to draw out of all of this is that the elite were always the Persians. Okay. Now, um, so some more sources. The Gospel of the Twelve Apostles, uh, 692 to 705, and there shall rise up from among them a warrior and one whom they called a prophet, and they shall be brought into his hands, and the south shall prosper. And by the hooves of the horses of its armies, it shall trample down and subdue Persia and devastate Rome. So we can see elements of the south appearing in the narrative. So we go on to the next one. So we have the short Syriac chronicle of 775, which says, and Muhammad and the Arabs went forth from the south and entered the land and subdued it. As you can see there, uh, there's a focus, of, uh, a focus on the south there. And then we turn to the chronicle of 1234. Um, and this one um, I got from Stephen Shoemaker. He said that the Chronicle of 1234 was based on uh, the, the Dionysius Chronicle of 845, which in turn borrows from the Chronicle of Theophilus of Edessa in around the year 750. So, you know, have to take that, you know, with a pinch of salt, you know, because it's the source based on a source based on a source, but it says anyway, Therefore, this Muhammad, while in the measure and stature of youth, began to go up and come down from his city, Yatrib, to Palestine for the business of buying and selling. So, so you can see here, but, there's... But let me just jump in here. You're, you're saying that this was written in 845, re, re, uh, being redacted or borrowing from something, the Theophilus of 750, way up in Edessa. And so that would, that, I mean, that would fit perfectly because by that time, Mecca, and it would have been called Mecca at that time. Why they're still calling it Yathrib, I don't know. Mecca would be well known by 750. Yeah, um, I, but I suppose, you know, if we, if we take it in, in, in terms of the, the Chinese sources, we can see that, you know, by the year 750, there's, there's a strong beginning of the Southern narrative. Now, when exactly it started, you know, in, um, in terms of a full story, it's hard to say, but we can see elements of it gradually coming into focus here with this with this source here. Okay, okay that's great. Now we move on to the following. With the rise to power of the Abbasids, the southern narrative was supported and the northern narrative was suppressed. Mecca in the Hijaz offered many advantages. It was a clean slate on which to write their new story, how they liked it. Islam's Persian origins could be erased. The Quran's origins as the patched together writings of a Jewish Christian sect with its Idumean or Petra links could be hidden and replaced with a tale of an ignorant prophet who got it all sent down by an angel. Islam's origins as a rags to riches tale was preferable to a Persian oligarchical power struggle. What better way to stop the Arabs rebelling against the Persians than for the Persians to lead the way and then to remake their first leader into an Arab? Arabs then think they are in charge when it is, in fact, still the Persians. So that's how I see um, this move down to the south. It suited the Abbasids. They could rewrite history the way they wanted it. They could um, ignore the early stories about the Tayaye and they could say instead that it was the Quraysh, which is their, their clan, that was the instigators from the beginning. So it suited them down to the ground. And the, uh, the cherry on the cake was to um, give a new narrative around the, the key protagonist of, of uh, Iyas, um, or Muhammad, and to make him come across as if he were an Arab. So that's the the idea that's, uh, that I, I see of how it came about. So the conclusion then, really, of part one, 
is that the star standard Islamic narrative is wrong about where Islam began. It says Islam began in the Hejaz, but that turns out to be false. The real story began with the Tayyaye way up in the north. So that's it, Jay. Terrific. This is good. Let's go ahead and, and stop your sharing there. And I, I'd like to just kind of... Now, these are the notes that I took, and I, I've taken two full pages of notes here. Let me just go through so we can tie it all together. Because what you've done here, you've actually you've put together this these two this scenario of the north going to the south and in that direction. And I love the fact that you've named the north the north northern historical story versus the the south, which is sin, and that's the southern Islamic narrative. <laughs> Terrific. So let's just take that and let's go ahead, put that in and unpack it. And what you, what you started out by saying, you, you, you took four, uh, you start off by saying four criteria that you're going to be using as your dictums. The first idea that, that this whole idea of Muhammad is a composite fiction. It does not, it doesn't come suddenly. It evolves over, in this case, you're talking about a hundred and 150 years. And that the earliest Muhammad, the seventh century Muhammad, Please make, be careful, folks. Don't think that that's the Muhammad of the ninth century. He's nothing to do with the ninth century. Get that out of your head. The same name, yes, but not the, the same person. That's good that you that you make that emphasis, and I'm glad we've got that there. And then you said it, to understand what I'm saying, let's look and see how it went from the north to the south. And so you're saying that's a progression as well. So you're going from Muhammad to Muhammad, the Muhammad of the seventh century, moving to the Muhammad of the ninth century, of, and you're also going from the north down. To the south and that the earliest sources, sources this is the ones that we're going to the the seventh century they confront that narrative that's in the that's uh in in the ninth century and they also help us see where it goes along that path and i love what you've done in this whole this this entire uh episode you've taken us along that path and you start by saying let's go back to the seventh century who is there it's the taia and they have been expurged. That's why we don't know anything about them, because they have been thrown out by all the later traditions. But you do need to say that these Tayaye, they have a history, and they start way down in the south, not the south Hijaz, but the south Yemen, what would be to Yemen today, the Hadramat at that period. And you're saying way back in the second century, so you're, there would be no, uh, there are probably, or, or, or I shouldn't say no, but there are probably, probably very little memory of that part of the Tayaye. They come from the Yemen, from the very far south, and they go all the way up to Shamat, which is what would be the Nabataean area. Uh, that would be Edom, and that would be Petra, and uh, what today would be Jordan, and uh, I guess you might say par parts of Israel. So that's, they go to the north. Then by the 6th century, so that's the 2nd century, by the 6th century, they then split into two groups. And the two groups are Syria, the Ghassanids in Syria, and the Lachmids in Iraq. So now we're in the 6th century. And then by the seventh century, those two groups, which if anybody has studied their history, you will know that the Ghassanids became a buffer state for the Byzantines and the Lachmids become a buffer state for the Persians or the Sassanids. That's well known historically. So it's great that you've done this. So now we then move into the seventh century because these two groups, the Ghassanids and the Lachmids, they produce two different individuals who are also at, in competition to each other. From the Ghassanid area, you have Mu'awiyah. And from the Lachmid area, you have Ali. Go ahead. What did you want to say there? Yeah, just be careful not to identify them too closely. So just be aware that the Tayyaye were a subgroup within the Gasnets. They weren't identical with the Gasnets. They were part of the Gasnet population, not the entire population. And same with the Lachmids. They were a significant group within the population that had huge influence, but they weren't the entire population. Okay. If, if, if that makes sense, yeah. That's a great okay. corrective. Now, let me ask you this. Mu'awiyah, would he be a Tayaye? Um, I would say yes, yeah. Um, there's evidence from the Chinese source that um, talks about that. In fact, that he, there, there were, um, if I can remember it correctly, there was the Marwan clan and there was the, the Hashim clan within the Tayaye. And they put Mu'awiyah in one group and I think Muhammad is in the other group. As, as best as I, rem as I remember. 
and Muhammad yeah. would be the one that's in the Lakhmids, which is where Ali would come from as well. So then you yeah. then you move over to Tajikistan, and you talk about this Tajikistan, which is further east yet, uh, because this became the homeland for the Taiye, and that was the land of the Taiye, which is what we would consider today the Euphrates Valley, the Mesopotamia, the place actually where Abraham came from. But you then moved over and you said, let's look at, and then you really moved in to say, now let's take the northern, this northern narrative, this northern historical story, NHS. Let's look and see what, what uh, historical support we have for this. And I count one, two, three, four, five, six different supports you gave. Let's go through them real quickly, just to remind ourselves. You started with Thomas the Presbyter in 640 who refers to the Taiyai, uh, uh, he talks about this Muhammad who has a battle with the Romans and he uses the word Muhammad and that would be the, 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 the Pahlavi spelling of the word Muhammad. So that is in 640, you see the name come up, but that Muhammad is not the Muhammad of the ninth century. That's the Muhammad of Ilya Ibn Kabisa, which we're gonna be getting into in the next episode. You then move to 636, you kind of bound back four years with the fragment of Arab conquest. And that's in Syria. So here you have Thomas Presbyter is way in Pahlavi area. That's off to the east in what today is Iran. And then you move and say, listen, the fragment of the Arab conquest also refers to Muhammad killing many people, but way over in Syria. So here's this Muhammad head is appearing again, but not the Muhammad of the ninth century. And that's where this confusion keeps coming in. This is the Muhammad of Syria, again, in the north. And then you go, to 70, you go way back to 79 AD with Pliny the Elder who refers to this, oh, I don't know how to pronounce it either, uh, but he refers to this whole area, the smaller land up there in the north, very far north, as Arabia. So we know we're talking about Arabia in the north again. And I think a lot of people would have thought, oh, that must be Saudi Arabia today, because they're thinking of the narrative, the fact that that's what it's called on our maps today. No, no, this is much further north. In fact, that includes, as you put on the map, that also includes parts of southern Turkey and northern Syria. And then you get to the Hispanic Chronicle of 754. Now that's the time when uh, that's the time when the Abbasids are coming into in, into play. They are already into play. And you talk about the fact that this refers back to 618 to the Saracens rebelling against the or these Tayaye. They uh, the, the, they rebel against the or the known as the Tayaye, and they are. According to this chronicle, they are in Syria, Arabia, and Mesopotamia. And this Arabia, of course, as we know from Pliny the Elder, would include Syria. So that's much further north again. And that their leader is Muhammad again. So there is the gay. This is why this, you're leading up to what we're going to be doing in the next episode. The fifth evidence you come up with Sabaeus in 660s. Sabaeus, well known, he talks and he does use the name Muhammad. But he puts, he says this Muhammad, and he refers to him as, again, part of the Tayaye and in Chattachistan. So that again puts so that this Muhammad we're talking about is a seventh century Muhammad. He's not the ninth century Muhammad. And then number six, you come up with the Byzantia Arab Chronicle. You call it that. I, I note it as the Apocalypse of Pseudo Methodius Continua to Arabica. It's a huge name, but it's become so famous because Patricia Kroon made it so famous from 741, which refers to Mecca. Of course, people have jumped on that saying, ah, oh, that's the Mecca. Even Patricia Kroon says, that's the Mecca we're looking for. No, it isn't. Because as you've pointed out, that Mecca is way up in Edessa near Haran, which is in southern Turkey. Turkey. That would have been where most people in the 8th century, well, all the people in the 8th century thought that Abraham was born and, and grew up and spent his life. So that's why it makes sense then that they was known as the land of uh, Abraham. Too far north because the real Ur has not yet been found yet, was not been found until the 1800s. And that's where you say that the beginning of the sin comes in, or the southern uh, Islamic narrative starts to uh, introduce. And I love what you did by putting up that graph of that timeline there, because you said there's a, there's a bit of an interlap between the northern NHS and the SIN coming in this, uh, later on. So the NHS starts to dis, starts to disappear once the southern Islamic narratives comes in, and that starts to take over. But there is a little bit of interlap, and you're putting it at the date the date around eight six eighty is where the southern inter, the southern narrative starts to be introduced. And what's great is you start with someone like John Ben Carr. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, again, six, again, proofs that you brought forward to, under, to help understand that evolution of the Southern, the Southern narrative. And you start with John Barr Penke in 687, who refers to Zubair, who remember was the governor of underneath Abdul Malik, uh, lived in Petra, did, rebelled against 
the governor, I have the, I'm sorry, uh, against uh, uh, Abdel Malik, and destroys Petra and takes the Black Stone with him. And as he takes the Black Stone, if we haven't really got into the Black Stone yet. We need to do that, Mel, because what we're now finding out is the Black Stone is, wherever, is always where God's presence is. So when you take the Black Stone with you, you take God's presence with you. So when he then flees to the south, you can see then all the pilgrims, fall, pilgrims follow him. They want to go where the Black Stone is. Now, that's a whole other time. But what you do say is this is the beginning then of that movement down south where now everything moves south. And then you give the example of Jacob Edessa, who writes about this. Some people, you put it to around 688. Most people put that document to 705. Again, 8th century. And that he's talking about the fact that the people over there in Wasit and in Kufa are paying west and those in Egypt and Fustop are paying, playing east. And he thought in 705 that this was Jerusalem. He was off by three to eight degrees, as we now know today. Nonetheless, that's the understanding, because it's obvious that they were not playing south. It was where they should have been praying for. So already you can see now that he's locating this further north. Nonetheless, the Chinese then come in, and this is what I love. You're bringing in some uh, extra chronic material, and what makes this so powerful is that they would have no agenda. They are neutral observators, observers, not observators, what a terrible word, observers. As neutral observers, you can trust them better, and they also would have not had any doctored material. By, for, by virtue of the fact that this is all coming out of China, there'd be no way that the Abbasids could control this. They would not have been able to eradicate it. And so that's why, in some ways, they're much more objective. Be, being more objective, they're the better people to look at, to see, because they are noticing that there's a difference, and they're seeing and they're saying that there is a difference between the North and South again. And what do they say? Well, they talk about these people from Taiye. They call them Dashi. Uh, and they, uh, you, 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 you talk about their name Dashi, which is the Chinese re uh, rendering of Taiye. That it, again, it's transliteration. You would we you would not pronounce it. They would not pronounce it the same way we would pronounce it. But that's how they wrote it. And that they have envoys that come in 705, 711, 741, and then 756. And that those the, who those who come in 705, 711, 741 say one thing, and that is that this is all much further north. These are the Taiye they're working with. But when they come in 756 to seven. 58 during under the Tang Tang government, everything seems to change. And there's a difference in their envoys coming and they're saying there's a big change going on now. And they're making and they're saying they refer to Muhammad by name. Now they're referring to this man named Muhammad by name. They talk about the Qureshi who are introduced in their documents. And they're mentioned that these Qureshi, who they call Guli, Quraysh, Guri, you can see the transliteration, and they don't call him Muhammad, they call Mokemo. <laughs> Mokebo. <laughs> Mokebo would be the way they pronounce Muhammad. But they talk about these Quraysh who are the Persian elite. They are the Persian elite. They're off in the east. And they're referring to that. That should wake us all up. Because now we're seeing that the Abbasids who are from the east, they are from much further north. They hate the Umayyads. We now see that. And the Chinese are actually showing where the sequence happens. It happens somewhere between 741 and 758. Well, who comes to power between 741 and 758 but the Abbasids? They take over power in 749. And they are the ones that take the headquarters from Damascus and bring it down to what is today Baghdad, called Stesiphon back in those days. So that's amazing. What you're showing here, see, I'm sitting, you're listening it for the first time, and you're actually... You're actually showing from looking at all these documentations that you have been able to glean all over the place, Mel. You're actually recreating what I've already known, but didn't know how to put uh, any bones, any meat to, because I only had the bare bones. You're putting the meat to it by showing the documentation that supports it. I've always known that there was a difference between the Umayyads and the, and, and, and the Abbasids, and you can see that immediately, because why would you take headquarters up in Damascus, which has been the headquarters all the way since the time to, from 619, 622, why would you take it down to Baghdad over there in the, uh, in the east? Unless, of course, you are bringing in an entirely new empire. The Chinese picked this up, and it's there in their documentation. They would not have an agenda here. They're just writing what their envoys are coming back with and what they're noticing. And they're noticing that these people in the east, they're in Baghdad and further east. They, have, they are Qureshi. They are Persians. And they refer to them. Now, do they refer to them, or are you referring to them as the white coats, black coats? They are. They are actually caught to the, the Chinese themselves are, caught, are actually describing what they wore. So that's from that's in the sources. And I, I have a, an image for you to, to make it clear for everyone. Do you imagine a chessboard? You have 
the white pieces on one side, they are the Umayyads. On the, on the other side, you have the black okay, pieces. Okay, those are the, the Abbasids. Abbasids. Okay. And so white piece chess, the pawns, in their cases, so they say, coach, in your case, let's just use a Chinese chessboard to even make it more clear. Yeah. And the pawns are the Arabs. All the elite are the back row. The kings, okay. the queens, the knights, they are the powerful ones at the back. The Arabs are the pawns. They are the, the cannon fodder for all of, of the okay. Persian That's um, interesting way to put it. That's the way I would describe it. You know. So it's fascinating how you're bringing this whole Chinese element into it. I love you doing that because that, make, that makes your argument so much more powerful uh, because of the fact that they don't have an agenda. They are neutral observers. There's no, there's no reason why they would lie. Uh, they don't. They they would not try to doctor the material for any any pol political gain on their part. They're just noticing and they're putting it out there. And what they're noticing is there is a difference. There is a change between 741 and 758. And then you bring in gospel of uh, uh, the gospel of twelve apostles in 705. That precedes the Chinese material. And this gospel of seven apostles again brings up this idea of this movement down south the short syriac chronicle of 775 refers to this all this is happening down in the south so that's redacting it back to again this would be well into the abbasid area and then you talk about the chronicles 1234 of dionysius uh, that's dated to 845 but it's referring to material that was lifted from theo uh, the uh, theophilus of edessa in 750 and referring to this movement from the north to the south brilliant stuff why did they do this? And this is how you went. And this is what I love. Why would this, uh, why would the Abbasids try to eradicate everything that have gone ahead? Why do they create a whole new place and a whole new person and a whole new narrative? Why this narrative from NHS down to SIN, NHS down to SIN, from the Northern historical story, which should remain, well, that's because that's the Umayyad story. They don't want anything to do with the Umayyads. They want to eradicate the Umayyads. They want a clean slate. They want a completely new clean slate. Therefore, they have the book, the man, the place, and the, the, the narrative. So they create, eradicate that, and they bring back their, uh, they erase the, any per Persian uh, uh, origins, which is in the north. They erase any Edomian, Edomian uh, origins. For people who don't know what we're talking about, that's Edomite origins. You've, you've gone through this with Job. Uh, and then they want to show that their prophet was not a king like the original Muhammad was. He was a king. He had 30 villages. He was powerful. He was a, a Christian on top of that. Their prophet is not a Christian. Their prophet is a Muslim, and he comes from rags to riches. Well, every prophet goes from rags to riches. So there is that same narrative that's all through the Bible. We have that same story. We even have it now in this story, this new narrative, which is a Southern narrative. It is Southern Islamic narrative, now makes him rags that becomes rich from Mecca to Medina. And then, of course, they introduce the Quraysh, the, the Quraysh, uh, who are the tribe, supposedly, of Muhammad. We can't find any reference of any people called Quraysh anywhere that far south, nor certainly not from uh, Mecca and Medina. And that's why then they introduced their prophet. So I hope, I mean, th this has been fascinating. I love this kind of stuff because you're taking a whole swath of history, looking over a period of at least about 100, maybe even 150 years you're looking at. You're showing that almost everything is in the north. It's the Umayyad narrative that's in the north. It now needs to be brought down to the south. That new narrative, this southern Islamic narrative, has to make sure that that narrative is the one that is then imposed. And that's why it takes then to the ninth century, another century later, to finally get it written down with Ibn Hisham in 833. And then finally, they get it all put together by 870 when Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, and all those start putting the, uh, the sayings together. And the story itself is finally created in 923, the 10th century. So this would make sense. This is fascinating because we now understand how the Abbasids wanted to eradicate and introduce their own narrative. Good stuff. So what's the next episode? The next episode, we're going to look at who the protagonists for the beginnings of Islam. So that's what we're going to look at. Oh, so we're going to go back to the original Muhammad. We're going to go back to yeah. the first Muhammad, the 7th yeah. century Muhammad. Oh, I can't wait. This is going to be fun. And God, listen, for those of you who have been following us, you've been seeing what Mel and this group have been doing in Sneakers Corner. Please, please, please continue to unpack what, they're, what he's saying. Don't just sit there and read it and say, that was a great video. Uh, we love what you're doing. Say, what is it about that, that you're finding that is helpful to also hammer us, try to get us, put us on the back foot. Try to see if you can find any chinks in Mel's armor. <laughs> he loves that.
he, this is what he thrives for, and this is why he stays up late at nights, just to make sure that he answers all your questions. We're going to stick this up there, throw it up there, and then we're going to let and see what kind of response we get from you all. God bless you. This has been fun, Mel. Thanks so much for coming on board. Okay, okay this is Mel right over there, over in Europe, and me here in the United States. We're about 3,000 miles apart, but isn't technology great? We can sit there, still talk to you face-to-face. -face. Over and out. Thank you.